All right, guys. So no questions on the homework, right? Going once. Going twice. All right. Let's look at this one. So on your review, you have three functions that are given to you, f, g, and h. And I'm going to ask you to do a series of questions based off of those functions. And the first one is, can you state the domain of f of x in interval notation? So, whoops. Here is function f of x. And we know algebraically the domain restrictions occur when you have a denominator with a variable in it or if you have an even radical. So in this case, we have an even radical. Uh, the domain restriction arrives right here. The Whatever's under the radical, so x plus 1, has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if you solved that, you'd get the inequality x is greater than or equal to negative 1. But they do say in interval notation, so all solutions that are greater than or equal to negative 1 would be negative 1 to infinity. So just make sure you're following instructions on um, the notation that I want. And make sure negative 1 has a bracket because it is okay to take the square root of a 0. So when you plug in negative 1, it'll still work. So this next one's kind of strange because you have function f, which we were just looking at. So negative square root of x plus 1. And then there's a subtract 3 after the side. And then they want you to add it to function h, which is this guy. And this is kind of atypical for adding terms, but there's only a couple of like terms here you have to consider. This negative 3 and this positive 4 can combine. Everything else is its own separate term that are they're not going to combine at all. So there's a few different answers you guys can give me. Most kids like to put the quadratic term first. So 2x squared, um, you could say minus square root of x plus 1. And then when you combine those constants together, you can put a plus 1 off to the side. But since the directions don't say anything about like particular order, any simplified answer is okay. The only thing that wouldn't be okay is if you guys did not simplify the answer because we're pre-calc. We're better than that. All right, moving along. Don't forget, you guys can speak if you need to. <laughs> All right, g times h. So don't fall into the algebra 2 trap of not using parentheses. So here's function g. And then here's function h. And if you're going to try to multiply these together, you just have to remember that all the terms have to be distributed to all the other terms. So like negative 4x times 2x squared would be negative 8x to the third. And you got to keep going. So let's see, that's negative 16x. This is a plus 10x squared. And then what, plus 20 on the end? So again, it doesn't say anything about what sort of order. It just has to be simplified. That's probably not the answer I have on my answer key. I'm sure the answer key, they switch these two terms around to put it in what we know is standard form order, but whatever. Okay, then h minus g. This happens a lot in algebra 2, where we set up h, 2x squared plus 4, and then they subtract function g, and they write this down. Why is this kid going to get it wrong? He's subtracting all of function g? Not the way he wrote it. He's going to have to remember to distribute the subtraction to both the negative 4x and the 5. So again, I need a simplified answer. 2x squared is the only quadratic term. Um, this will be a negative negative, so a positive 4x. And then watch the constant. It's 4 minus a 5. So that would be a minus 1. All right, then ga of negative 6. So I don't really like that notation. I prefer g of h of negative 6, but that's up to you. I just like that notation for evaluation in particular. Hey, thanks. Oh, there's Emily. <laughs> All right, h of negative 6. Start on the inside here and evaluate h of negative 6. I already forgot what h was. Is it the 2x squared one? So 2x squared plus 4, when you evaluate that at negative 6. All right, a little mental math for your long weekend Monday, Tuesday. Uh, what is that, 36? 72 plus 4, is that 76? Okay, good. So then what they want you to do now is take 76, because that's the answer to this part, and evaluate that inside of g. 
All right, and this is where I usually give up on my mental math because I would like you guys to help me with this part. So negative 4 times 76 plus 5. Negative 299. Okay. Excellent. So composition, I truly feel like if you rewrite it in this notation, this other notation for composition, it's a little easier for your brain to wrap around what you have to do. When you're composing functions at a number, it's easiest if you start on the inside of the composition and work your way back out of the problem. All right, and here we are going to compose, but this time we're just going to compose and create a new function. So not really anything going on here. Again, if you don't like this notation, um, switch it for this notation. But you're going to put function f inside of function g. So if this is function g, you're going to write it, except what I'm going to need you to do is instead of x, you're going to leave that empty. And you're going to place function f where the x used to be. Now, this one's a little more complicated than um, the domain restriction question we've had before. Now, this denominator can be cleaned up a bit. So, numerator's boring. The denominator is, what, 2x squared minus x minus 3? So, this is great as far as who your new function is. But now I'm going to ask you about a domain restriction. I do not need you guys to give me interval notation stuff here. I just need you to figure out what x can't be. And I'll give you a little hint. There's going to be two numbers that x can't be because you have a quadratic in your denominator. So remember, denominators can never equal zero. So your job is to figure out what would make your denominator zero, and those are the things that x cannot be. So you can solve this quadratic however you want. Whenever this question comes up, it's always going to be factorable. Um, so how about 2x and x? And then if you throw a negative 3 in the first parenthesis and a plus 1 in the second parenthesis, that should add up in the middle to negative 1x. Mm -hmm. So remember, this factor can't be 0, and this factor can't be 0. So if you tell me 2x minus 3 can't be 0, and you solve that, that means x can't be 3 halves. And then if you solve this one, x can't be negative 1. So we're stepping it up a little bit on that question. We've seen the domain restriction question two tests in a row. This is your third time you've seen this concept. So don't be surprised when it gets a little more aggressive the third time. Uh, it's not going to be a linear denominator necessarily. It could be a quadratic. So you have to find both solutions. All right. Inverses. Let's talk about it. Draw a function that is one-to-one -one and explain why and what it means to be one-to-one. -one. So you should be using some vocabulary about some testing. Do you remember the test that we applied in this lesson? It was last week. It's like a week ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, let me just draw this for you. How do I know that's a function? Because it passes the vertical line test, yes. So if the original passes the vertical line test, that means the original is a function. How do I know his inverse is a function? Because the original passes the horizontal line test. So that means the inverse is a function. So if you have a particular original graph and it passes both the horizontal and the vertical line test, you have what's called a one-to-one -one function. Because we've seen cases where the original was a function but the inverse is not. We've seen cases where the original was not a function, but if you could come up with an inverse function, that was crazy. Um, I'll give you a hint on the test. This is like a multiple choice question. So I'll give you a bunch of graphs and I'll say which of the following are one to one functions. So you're going to be looking for things that pass the horizontal and vertical line test. Everyone got real nervous when the word explain came up and you're like, ah, I don't want to explain anything. It's just going to be multiple choice. All right, here, finding the inverse. So technically what you're supposed to do first on all these questions is make sure that the inverse even exists by graphing it and making sure it passes the horizontal line test. Spoiler alert, it does. So let's go ahead and find the inverse. Your first step is to switch the x and y. So remember, g of x is fancy talk for y. So when you switch the x and y, x equals negative cube root of y minus 1 plus 3. So this question... <clears throat> There's quite a bit of room here. There's more steps than you probably would anticipate to solve for y. And remember, you're kind of working through this yourself, so show whatever steps you need to show. 
Uh, you're going to start by subtracting the 3 over. And then before we worry about the radical, there is a coefficient in front of the radical, a negative 1. So you could think of it as dividing by a negative 1, or that's kind of a weird thing to say. So usually what we end up doing is we multiply both sides of the equation by a negative 1. Either way, it switches every term sign. So this becomes, you can write negative x plus 3. Um, I don't have any problem with that, but a lot of people in the math community don't like the lead term to be negative, so they might switch it for 3 minus x. They're the same thing, so it does not matter. And then over here, the negative negative would cancel out to a positive cube root of y minus 1. So finally, you can get rid of the cube root by cubing both sides. So this is where I'm going to make the executive decision to be lazy. Because it didn't say, come up with an inverse function and make sure it's like super pretty and in this form. It just said, find an inverse function. So rather than expanding 3 minus x to the third power, I'm just going to leave it as 3 minus x quantity to the third power. And then here the cube root and cube power would cancel each other out, 2y minus 1. Which you guys are almost home free. Your final step would be to add 1 to both sides. But please don't fail me now, guys. We are not going to call this y. Because you can't. What was the original function's name? g of x. So his inverse would be called this thing. g inverse. g to negative 1 of x. Equals. And I would just write 3 minus x to the third power plus 1. So it didn't say, like, expand, foil it out. It didn't say to do anything weird with the quantity to the third power. Thank goodness, because that's actually a lot more complicated than it looks. Um, I'm pretty sure the one on your test is significantly less involved. I'll put it that way. All right, part B. Uh, function f of x, which we know really just means y which means my pen's going to work. There we go, y. So first step is the same. You're going to switch all of your x's and y's with each other. Um, this one's got a bit of bad news, though. Because your next step is normally to solve for the y, but when I look through this question, I notice there's a couple y's rolling through it. And to make matters worse, everything's kind of trapped in a proportion right now. So easiest way to approach this question is to free it up by cross-multiplying. So like this times this, distribute the x everywhere please, so you have a 2xy plus 3x equals, and then this is significantly boring because 1 times y minus 5 is just y minus 5. So now you got to pull out some Algebra 2 tricks. If you have more than one y in the problem and you're trying to solve for y, you got to bring them all to the same side of the equation. In this case, they're not going to be combinable, so we'll have another trick we've got to pull out in a second. So let's move all the y's to the left, because I said so, which means anything that doesn't have a y, you're going to move to the right. Okay, so gone, gone, and you have 2xy minus y cannot combine those, so just leave it. And then over here, it's kind of gross. Uh, negative 5 minus 3x is fine. Negative 3x minus 5, also fine. And this is where you pull out your Algebra 2 trick. When you have two terms and they both have that common y in them, and i got to isolate for y, your trick is to factor out the y. So if you factored out the y, now you have 2x minus, careful guys, what's left? 1, thank you. And then now we're almost home free. You just got to divide by 2x minus 1. Don't ruin it here, guys. You can't call this y. What was the original's name? f of x. So his inverse would be called f inverse. So it is not your job to figure out whether you have the best answer or not. It is just your job to find an inverse function that would work, and this one would work. Uh, in my brain and on my answer key, I have all the varieties of this solution or this uh, function. So you don't have to like mess around with the way it looks. For instance, when I told you guys we're going to bring all the y's to the left, some of you were like, no, I want to bring the y's to the right. So if you deviated from the plan there, 
you have um, 3x my uh, sorry 3x plus 5 over 1 minus 2x as an answer. So that's equivalent, and it's totally fine. So that's fun. Let's not have to do that again. That'd be great. All right. Can you find the graph of an inverse if I give you the graph of the original? So on the test, it's going to be very clear. I think Mrs. Hoffbauer even put, like, dots on the ordered pairs. So, like, come on, guys. You can do this. Uh, let's kind of make some executive decisions. Let's say there's a, a point right there. And let's say that's at the ordered pair 0, negative 5. I don't know if it is. Just pretend. And then uh, let's say this ordered pair here is 4, negative 3. And let's say this ordered pair here is 8, negative 2. I mean, it probably isn't, but whatever. That says 8, negative 2 on the side there. So when I have to graph an inverse, the first thing I do, because I have a really terrible like time graphing, obviously, I draw the reflection line for inverses, which is y equals x, with like a highlighter or something. Or like a really crooked pencil, apparently. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so this is the line that inverses are always reflected over. And if I had a wonderfully artistic brain, I would be able to visualize this. Turns out I don't. So what I then do is I take my ordered pairs and I flip them because that's the basic definition of inverses is your x's and y's switch. So if this ordered pair is 0, negative 5, my inverse is going to have the ordered pair negative 5, 0. Wrong color. And then if this guy has the ordered pair 4, negative 3, my inverse will have the ordered pair negative 3, 4. And then if this guy has the ordered pair 8, negative 2, my inverse will have the ordered pair negative 2, 8. And then even though I'm a terrible grapher, <gasps> that was almost wonderful. I ruined it at the end. I got, I got too confident. Uh, even though I'm a terrible grapher, I, do, I can see the reflection, kind of. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe you can. Yours is probably better. Okay. New, new, new stuff. Power functions. So... Um, power functions, you're probably going to get a little assistance from your calculator as to what this looks like. But remember, guys, negative fifth power means that this is really negative 3 over x to the fifth power. So don't get confused when you look at the graph realizing, oh, there's something weird happening here. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just kind of tell you that this is what it looks like. Kind of. <laughs> Obviously, your calculator would give you a much prettier picture than that. And we need to be real careful about our domain and range and increasing and decreasing interval notation because some of us are getting a little sloppy as to like how we write it, what order we write it in. So for domain, by definition, is the set of all x values for which your function is defined. So sometimes I get kids who look at this and they say, oh, well, it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity because they're looking at the ends. Uh, is that true? No. In fact, algebraically, I can see that there's a, one number that x cannot be x can't be 0, because look at that denominator. So now visually, I can see what the discontinuity looks like. It's this gigantic asymptote in the middle of it. So for domain, while it does start at negative infinity, there's going to be an interruption at 0. So how do I indicate that 0 does not work? A parenthesis, and then you hop over 0 to the other side, and then keep on going. We haven't really discussed with you guys too much about how to determine range algebraically, but I'm looking at the graph, and I don't think I need to know how to find range algebraically, because look at the graph, guys. I think we have a similar interruption going in the, in the vertical direction. Zero, there's a horizontal asymptote. So range, while it does go forever low, there seems to be a disruption at zero. intercepts. Does this cross through the x or the y-intercept? No. And we had a little bit of a discussion during our, so we're going to write none here. We had a discussion during our lesson here. We had, we had cases where it like bounced off of the x-axis. And for this moment in time, I will accept if you would call that an x-intercept, if that ever happens on a graph. Um, but technically, by definition, it would have to go through the axis to be an x-intercept. We're going to discuss this at great length next week. <laughs> uh, but for now, I'll pretty much take any answer you give me on that case. This one didn't have either of those things happening, though. Never came close to the x or y intercept, uh, crossing the x or y axis. Is it continuous? 
No. <laughs> no, it is not. And you don't have to tell me why it's not continuous. Uh, just the word no works for me. End behavior. I know when they ask me for end behavior, they're looking for the left and right end behavior. So your function, if you look at the left side of it right here, what y value is it trying to approach? It's trying to approach y equals zero. That's called a horizontal asymptote. Again, we'll discuss this a lot in the next part of the unit. And then on the right side, it's doing the same thing. It's just coming from the other direction. So again, your function is trying to approach zero. Okay, think of this like a roller coaster track for a minute. I see two pieces of a roller coaster track. I realize they're disjointed. We'll get to that in a minute. But this piece right here is an increasing roller coaster track. What about this piece here? Also increasing. So does that mean my function is increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity? No, it is not. Remember that break in the domain? That also breaks up your interval for increasing behavior. So it is increasing from negative infinity to zero, and then some weird stuff happens, and then it continues increasing from zero to infinity. Was this roller coaster ever decreasing? No, it was not. So you can just write never. You wrote none, that's fine. All right, better good. Okay, here we go. Solving the radicals. So, um, I gave you some warnings about how to approach these questions. Your worst nightmare is when there's two radicals on the same side of the equal sign. So if you don't have that, that's great. And your job is to isolate the radical, and eventually we want to raise them to power so we can get rid of the radicals. So like here, we have a fourth root. Let's isolate that fourth root. We're going to subtract 5, obviously. So the fourth root of 128 plus 3x equals 4. And then mathematically, to undo a fourth root, we'd raise everything to the fourth power. Please be careful, guys. This is not a 16. What is 4 to the fourth power? 256. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we got it from here. So you guys are going to subtract 128 and divide by 3. This answer does come out to a fraction, I believe. Um, I would suggest you just bring it back to a fraction. If you tried to round it or truncate it, it would be a repeating infinite decimal. Um, so like if you wrote like point, I don't know what this comes out to, 131, 24, no, 8, eh. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> All right, divide by 3. Um, what's that decimal part if you divide it? 6 repeating. So like kids will tell me, oh, I, I put down like 0.67. And then when I went to go plug it in, it didn't work out. Well, that's because you changed the solution. Like 42.67 is not 42.6 repeating forever. So no, it's not going to work out. So keep it as a fraction when you go and plug it in and check. Remember, these are those annoying ones where you, you do all the work, you find a solution, and then sometimes they actually don't work. So if for some reason you get an answer and you plug it in and it doesn't work, do you remember what you do? You exit out and you write ext next to it because it's extraneous. And if you x out all of your solutions, that means there's no solution. Sometimes that does happen. I like these questions because I'm going to be checking them at the end and I'm going to walk away from that question feeling really darn good that I got the right answer. Because like this one, for instance, works out beautifully. Oh boy. All right, this next one, we have two radicals. The good news is they're not on the same side. Uh, the bad news is you're not going to be able to isolate this radical. Okay. We got this, guys. All right, we are squaring this side of the equation. And normally I don't write it out, but I am going to this time. I'm going to write out two of these guys multiplied together. The right-hand side of the equation, though, it's super easy. The square root and the squared will just cancel each other out. All right, here we go. What happens when you square a square root by himself? Well, that's the equivalent of squaring a square root. So they just knock out, and you get x. And you have a minus 3 square roots of x plus another minus 3 square roots of x. So that means you have minus 6 square roots of x. And then negative 3 times negative 3 is plus 9. 
A little bit of a downer moment because after all that work, I still have a radical in my problem. So we start the process all over again. I want to eventually square the equation. However, I'm not going to do that until I can get that radical isolated because this is messy. So, oh, this works out beautifully though. Look what happens here. You're going to subtract x and then they're going to cancel each other out. That's very fortunate. We're going to subtract 9 as well. And then in a minute, I'm probably going to divide by negative 6. Uh, what is that, negative 54? So here, I would go ahead and divide by negative 6. If you chose to square both sides right away, you'd have a 36 in front of that. It's still going to work out. I just wouldn't suggest it. Um, we have square root of x equals 9. <laughs> Be careful, guys. You're squaring both sides. And a lot of people tell me the answer was 3 here. That makes me sad because you're squaring. <clears throat> So right now we get x equals 81. So should I box it in and walk away? No, because I still have to check. All right, spoiler alert. When you plug it in, it works. Yay. All right. But do go ahead and check on the test, guys. That's important. OK, transformations. Um, whew. So transformations, they're showing up again on your test. Um, I want to look at the difference between these two, these two equations here functions, I should say. When I throw a negative in front of the function like that versus negative 3 square root of x plus 4. Now, first impressions of this right here. What does your algebra brain tell you to do to that, guys? It tells you to distribute the negative, right? That's what your brain would normally think of. So this function is actually negative 3 square root of x minus 4. So a lot of kids, when they're coming up with what are the transformations here? If I pretended like I didn't do this part, okay, I pretend I didn't even look there. Does the vertical reflection, does the reflection over the x-axis happen at the beginning of the problem or at the end of the problem? That's the, that's the kicker, right? You're like, I don't know. I keep getting this question wrong. So if you're going to say that this function was shifted up four first, then you would have to apply this reflection afterwards because it really ends up being a down for. Ah, that's confusing, I know. So here's my advice. If you ever run into this situation where you're like, I don't really know what to do. I don't know which one's first. If there's ever parentheses and there's implied distribution like we had here, go ahead and do the distribution and consider this equation or that function, not that one. And now that you don't have parentheses to worry about, now you can read it left to right. So that reading left to right business only works when you don't also have a distribution on top of it. So if I follow my own advice now and I have distributed, a good set of transformations would be, what is this called when you throw a negative in front? A reflection over the x-axis. And then a 3 in front of the function is called a vertical stretch of 3. And then if you keep reading, shifting down 4. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody here, but that's not the only acceptable answer. There's like four other ways, you, well, three other ways you could have ordered this and still had the acceptable order of operations. These, are get, these get really complicated. That's why we keep giving you guys graphed ones. They're a little more straightforward. Okay. Um, this one, though, you see how it's different? Reflection over x-axis, vertical stretch of 3, and then up 4. Clearly a very different function when you graph it. Um, can we talk about this real quick? A cubic function... So that would be this guy. No, it wouldn't. It would be this guy, x to the third power. Okay. So we are going to apply these three transformations in that order. Here we go. Vertical compression of one half. Where do you stick the one half if it's a vertical compression? Vertical compressions happen in front of your function, so they're going to happen right here. One half. And then down five. So down 5 would be right here. Notice I'm not distributing anything to that down 5 because it happened second. 
and then a reflection across the x-axis. So a reflection across the x-axis is where you throw a negative in front of your function. Would it be okay just to stick a negative right here? Uh-uh, because if you apply that reflection at the end, you do one of those. A negative in front of the entire function if it's done last. So your new function is negative one-half x to the third power, and then it's really going to say a plus 5. Did you have to distribute that, though? Could I have left negative in parentheses and walked away? Yeah, I could have done that. So this is where it gets very annoying as your teacher who's trying to grade all your tests because there's so many different correct answers I can take. It's up to you guys to make sure that you have one of them. All right, this one, reflection across the y-axis. Uh-oh, who remembers what that looks like? So if you got to reflect the other way, where does the negative show up? inside the function. So it's negative x um, to the third power. <laughs> okay, this is, gonna, this is way more difficult than the test. I apologize. Now if I shift everything right 4, doesn't that look like this? Okay. And again, it happened after the reflection, so I'm not distributing that reflection to it. And then up 7, that's an easy one. We just put a plus 7 here. Again, there's other correct answers that I could take here, but you don't have to worry about that. That's my job. All right. Those are tough. Remember this stuff? Some of you got away with uh, trying to do this without showing work. This time you have to show me work. Uh, you have a vertex, which is HK, and then I give you a random ordered pair, XY. And I told you it is a quadratic function, so make sure that you're plugging everything in where it goes. Since it's a transformed quadratic function, I might suggest you use this form. All right, so the y value is 24. I don't know, eh? The x value is 8. The h was a negative 2, so be careful on your sign right here, guys. Minus a negative 2 will be a plus 2. Some of you kind of had a mistake with the squared here. On the last test, I think this was a cubic function, so some of you had a squared instead of a cubic. So just be careful what function you have. And then um, plus k for us would be plus negative 6. So if you just wrote minus 6, that's fine. You guys still have to solve for a, though. So you're going to add the 6. All right, 30 equals, this is 10 squared, so that's 100. So a times 100. And then as promised, I told you sometimes the a values come out funky. Case in point, this a value is 3 over 10. So now you're going to go back and you're going to write your function. y equals 3 over 10, x plus 2 squared minus 6. I kept warning you guys that I was going to give you a weird A value coming up. Today's the day. All right. Um, could you find that matching worksheet you walked in and picked up that matching worksheet? Oops, there we go. So the answer key is on the back to this, and I think Mrs. Hoffauer did a beautiful job of writing you some extra notes in case you like got stumped as to why one of them matched the other one. But what I would do is, I, I think what we should do at least, for 1 through 9 up here at the top of the worksheet, let's write out with some words and symbols what the transformations are, and then maybe you can figure out the matching from there. So f of x minus 2, when you have a minus 2 off to the side like that, how does that shift your function? Anybody? I heard down 2, I like that. So that one shouldn't be too difficult to find in the matching. What about when I throw a 2 inside the function with the x? What would you call that? It's a horizontal. So this is the great debate. Is it a stretch or a shrink or a compression? It's a compression. Very good. Or shrink if you want to be not fancy. It's a horizontal compression of 1 half. So what I think about when I look at horizontal compressions, because these are kind of hard to tell, it's going to shrink the x-intercepts. So like your function, like this guy right here, is at 
I'm just making this up. I don't know, like negative 1.4. So if you put a 2 inside that function, it's going to shrink your x-intercept back by a factor of half. So your new x-intercept um, would have been at negative 0.7. I don't know how easy that's. I need like bifocals, so I don't know which graph there matches, but you'll figure it out. Uh, there's another x-intercept you guys can determine also. And sometimes when you look at the graphs, you can just kind of tell like, Oh, that one's been horizontally shrunk. Yes. So the horizontal compression is mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. one third. Right, exactly. Yep, very good. So this next one has two different transformations. One is a vertical reflection across the x-axis, and the other one is a horizontal shift. So since those don't compete against each other, you don't have to worry about order, um, but you do need to think about how to describe that. So most of you just call this negative a reflection over the x-axis. Some of you have been calling it a vertical reflection. I'm okay with either of those. Um, and then a plus 2 inside the function is a horizontal shift of left 2. Oh boy. All right. So what if I throw a 2 in front of your function, and then I throw a negative inside the function? So again, one's vertical, one's horizontal. They don't compete against each other. Um, a 2 in front is called a... Vertical stretch, which brings your y values up twice as big. So vertical stretch of 2. And what happens when you throw a negative inside the function with the x? Some of you have been calling this a, horiz yes, a horizontal re uh, reflection. Or you can say it's a reflection over the y-axis this time. So you're looking for a graph that looks a lot skinnier than the previous one, and it looks reflected across the y-axis. This one bothers kids because they're like f of x divided by 2. So if that notation bothers you, what if you just wrote it has 1 half f of x? Because that's the same thing. So when you throw a 1 half in front of the function, um, we're going to call that a vertical, if you called it a stretch, I know what you mean, but it's really a vertical compression of half. Vertical things do exactly what you think they're going to do. So 1 half is going to shrink your your y's by half. And then x minus 2 inside the function there is going to be a right 2. I don't know why. I think those rigid transformations are actually harder for me to find than the other ones. I don't know. They really bother me. Um, and then, oh boy. Here, you have a negative in front of the function. And then you have x over 2. So if that notation bothers you, then just call it negative f of 1 half x. So the negative in front is going to reflect over the x-axis. That's a vertical reflection. And then the 1 half in the function is going to be a horizontal what? Is it stretch or compression? 1 half for horizontal is actually a stretch. So this is a reflection over the x-axis and a horizontal stretch of 2. So everything's opposite with the x's. How annoying. So all those x-intercepts are going to be doubled. They're going to be twice as far as they were. Okay, 8. We have a reflection across the y-axis and then a vertical shift. So those do not compete against each other, so you can do whatever order you want. So I'm going to say exactly that. I'm going to say reflection over the y-axis. That's that negative inside the function. And then up to. And then by the time you get to the last one, I think it's a one for one match here. Like there's nine functions and nine graphs. So you'll probably be able to figure out which one's left. Um, but a two in front of the function, f of x, and then minus two. Order of operations, guys. Which one is applied first? Because these are both vertical moves, so they do compete against each other. So the two, the vertical stretch can happen right away. So a vertical stretch of 2. Then down 2. Again, there's other ways that you could describe that where the vertical stretch happens at the end, but you don't need to worry about that. If someone's curious about that, you could have said down 1, then vertical stretch of 2. That would have been the same function. <clears throat> that would be undistributing the 2 or factoring out the 2. All right. So your job is to match them up.
that would be a good way to, to prep for this section of the test. It's going to be, just like on the last test, you guys had to match up like which function went with what graph. Similar idea happening. Um, and then there's going to be questions about, like on the review, where I give you a function and I need you to apply things in a certain order. And you're going to create a new function. You guys did a really nice job with that on the last test. A few of you got your horizontal and vertical things backwards, so just make sure you're careful about that. All right.